on behalf of the Executive Committee of the Museum Society, Mr. Sabya Sachi Mukherjee, the Director General of the CSMVS, and my own personal self, a very, very warm welcome to both of you, Stanley and Naresh. We are really looking forward to this evening's event. I know both of you have been extremely excited as we have been. So without much ado, I'd like to take a few minutes and please indulge me to introduce you to those two stalwarts. You may know them, but those who don't, please permit me. Stanley Pinto, a former advertising stalwart and musician from Mumbai. In 1959, at a very young age, Mr. Pinto started off as a jazz pianist in India, playing and leading his own bands in nightclubs in Mumbai, Delhi, and Calcutta. But he also wrote middles and op-ed articles for the Times of India. In 1964, when the charm of life as a professional musician began to fade, he did the next thing that appealed to him. He joined Lintas India, one of the most prominent advertising agencies in the country. He rose to director of the Lintas branch offices in India and then transferred to Lintas International as managing director of the company's operations in Indonesia and Malaysia. Now I'm going to have to tell you something. On his 50th birthday, having spent three years with Bozell Advertising as director of their South and Southeast Asia region, he withdrew from corporate life to move to Bangalore. We lost him here, but in Bangalore, he has lived the good life ever since. So Stanley, welcome to the Museum Society and to this evening's event. A few and is the editor of scroll.in, a digital news publication so very much required in today's turbulent times. He is the author of Taj Mahal Foxtrot, the story of Mumbai's Jazz Age, published by Roly Books. It's a wonderful publication. You all will enjoy going through it and do get a copy if your time and interest permits. This book has won the Dr. Ashok de Ranade Award, Ranade Award and the Shakti Bhatt First Book Account. Thank you both once again. And before I hand you over, we couldn't do these webinars without our technical team. They're a group of young, enthusiastic students, and they have stood by us for the last 12 months with all the seminars and webinars that we've been holding, led by Jason John, who made the announcement at the beginning. I really want to thank Sanjana, Rachel, and Yashraj for turning up Thursday after Thursday to be with us. So thank you so much, tech team. And now I hand you over to the technical team and let's sing, dance, tap our feet. And as you say, on with the show. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, good evening and thanks for that, uh, Firoza. Naresh, uh, before you go any further, let's take a look at Firoza again. Get Firoza on the screen. Can we get Feroza on the score? Oh, there she's up there. Nanesh, don't you just love that Madonna look on her face? Of course. Don't you just love it? I almost and, got, uh, Stanley, about, I almost got up and asked you. started to pray. Wh wh which Madonna are you talking about? Not the <laughs> sexy one. I'm talking about the Madonna that we all pray to. <laughs> I almost got on my knees to pray to her when she came on screen. Look Don't at do this. <laughs> Cross yourself now. All right, let's get on with it. All right, a moment of reverence then and on we go. Uh, good evening and it's lovely to uh, have so many of you all uh, on this program. I can see a whole bunch of friends. Uh, I can see Santa Cruz, I can see Colaba, I can see uh, Bangalore, and I can see Norway. Uh, so uh, it's it's uh, we have quite a geographical representation here. Where are you seeing this? Uh, 
Stanley, you need to at the bottom it says participants. Aha. And right. everybody's name oh, is in alphabetical right. order. Okay, got it. Yeah. Got it. All right. So um I thought um I'd sort of set the scene for uh Stanley by briefly running through uh, a, a history of jazz in Bombay, which is sort of the arc that my book takes. Uh, and then Stanley will fill in uh, all of the anecdotes and, and sort of make this dry history personal. Uh, so I am going to show you a few uh, pictures to start off with. And uh, in good fashion, my screen has decided to freeze. Ah, here we go. Okay. So like all origin stories, um, this uh, picture from 1935 is where Bombay jazz uh, had its seeds. Um, this is uh, a picture uh, in the ballroom of the Taj Mahal a hotel with which uh, many of y'all are doubtless familiar. And the chap in the middle, his name is Leon Abbey. Uh, he's a violinist from Minnesota. And Leon Abbey uh, brought the first African-American band to play in Bombay. And uh, sort of all the accounts from that time talk about how excited Bombay was because for the first time, uh, Bombay had heard this great music from America, which was the world's pop on record. Uh, and there had been local bands playing it, but this for the first time was a band straight from the source that was playing the music. And uh, let's try it again. And after Leon Abbey left, uh, he left um, after the 1935 season, uh, because like so many uh, uh, people from uh, America and Europe, he found the Bombay heat too difficult to take. Uh, other musicians uh, from uh, America came to town. Um, this is the band of Cricket Smith. Uh, you can see him uh, shyly in the corner. Uh, and uh, they played here in the 1936-1937 season. And the most famous member of that band was this guy. His name was Teddy Weatherford. Uh, he was a pianist who had cut his teeth in uh, Chicago in the 1920s. And then escaping racism, but also uh, seeking adventure, spent almost the rest of his life in, uh, in Asia. In, uh, uh, he was in Shanghai for a long time, and Shanghai was a, a, a great jazz city. Uh, in the in the twenties and thirties, and he died in Calcutta uh, uh, of of cholera. Uh, they say that uh, his uh, funeral was one of the largest funerals that Calcutta had ever seen uh, in the nineteen forties. But pretty soon, uh, the African Americans began to employ Indian musicians to play alongside them. And this uh, from 19, uh, from the, the traffic wasn't going only one way. Uh, in the same season, in the same year that uh, um, Leon Abbey led the first African-American band to India, this couple also visited. They look very Indian here, but uh, they're actually an African-American couple that's uh, reverent uh, to see Andes from Gandhi's uh, campaign of civil uh, disobedience and what strategies they could learn. And uh, eventually Sue and, uh, and Howard Thurman met Gandhi in Bardoli uh, outside Surat. And the evening ended with Gandhi asking them to sit holding the, the saxophone uh, in the center of this picture. And his band was like the nursery or the hothouse for the Indian jazz scene. Many of the people in this picture would go on to become prominent musicians themselves. Um, I'm now gonna sort of run through a bunch of uh, pictures of the great um, sort of the prominent 
uh, musicians from the 30s who would go on to become the mainstays of the Indian jazz scene quite soon. Uh, this is a chap uh, called Frank Fernand, uh, who uh, would uh, go on to become, uh, in addition to be being an important jazz trumpet player, uh, musicians were Anglo-Indian, and therefore that gave them a monopoly on uh, the spaces in Bombay that were racially segregated, like the Bombay Gym and the Yacht Club. Uh, and Stanley has a story uh, about going to see him and taking tea with him uh, that he will probably tell us later. This chap uh, was a Parsi who was born Kawasji Khatao. Uh, and Stanley knew him and his brothers, I think, uh, boxers. Uh, but uh, he took the name Ruby Cotton and spent then much of his life uh, in uh, Delhi, where, among other things, Soli Sorabji, the late lamented Soli Sorabji, who passed away recently, was uh, among his great patrons. This chap uh, was born Antonio Xavier Vaz, uh, but uh, sort of rose to fame as Chick Chocolate. And uh, he was known as the Louis Armstrong of India. Um, his three daughters were, were sort of prominent uh, vocalists in their own right and married three men who, would also, uh, who were also prominent jazz musicians. Uh, that would be Braz Gonsalves, uh, Johnny Fernandez, and uh, Steve Sequeira. By the 1940s, Jazz had sort of really taken root in Bombay. And uh, Bombay had its own swing club, uh, which uh, I must caution is different from a swingers club, Stanley. A bit different. Stanley, a little before. I mean, Dave Brubeck with Paul Desmond and Joe Morello. And this is Chick Chocolate again. And by the late 40s, uh, jazz musicians were working in the Hindi film studios, uh, both as musicians in the orchestras and helping. And this is Frank Fernand in the studio, conducting an orchestra. And Dave Brubeck, um, Stanley, to, to go back to what you were saying. Um, by the late 1950s, at the height of the Cold War, the Americans decided to deploy jazz as a Cold War weapon to win the hearts and minds of those of us in uh, the colored peoples of Africa and uh, Asia. And the first uh, torpedo they fired was Dave Brubeck, who came here in 1948. This is a picture of Dave Brubeck uh, uh, having a jam session. Uh, I got this picture from Nakul Mehta, and this was shot in his home. Uh, that is Ustad uh, Halim Jafar Khan, uh, who he was jamming with. <laughs> and uh, who followed was this chap. Uh, Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington, sitting at Cafe Nas uh, on uh, overlooking, uh, on Malabar Hill overlooking uh, Marine Drive. Who also came was Louis Armstrong, uh, whose visit, um, I believe, coincided uh, with the visit of the Pope. And so all the good uh, Catholics had to decide whether to go to see Louis Armstrong or whether to go to see the Pope, uh, who was here for the Eucharistic Congress. And I think uh, for many of them, it was an easy decision. Louis Armstrong won. Uh, both uh, Dave Brubeck and um, Duke Ellington uh, soaked up the sounds of, of India and the other places they had visited on their, um, uh, on their trip. Uh, and both of them produced albums that, uh, took, that sort of reproduced uh, in, through a jazz prism, uh, jazz imagining some of the sounds they heard. Uh, Dave Brubeck on this album, uh, where he has uh, been, uh, where, where, that, uh, where two Indian women with saris are uh, putting a turban on his head, as you can see. Uh, he, on this album, he has a song called um, Calcutta Blues. And Duke Ellington uh, 
on the far east suite uh, had a story I had a song called uh, Agra and also one called Bluebird of Delhi uh, which was uh, essentially uh, imitating um, uh, a minor's call so that sort of uh, briefly is the arc of my book and um, as we were beginning to uh, put together this, uh, uh, the, the, this presentation and this discussion, uh, a, a wonderful, um, by wonderful piece of serendipity, um, somebody uh, posted this uh, song poem, if you will, uh, on, on Facebook. Uh, it's by Ernest Flanagan, uh, who sort of spans the ages. He started off towards the end of the jazz era, I think, but was mainly in the beat group era. Uh, and now performs uh, a lot at, at weddings or, or used to until quite recently. And uh, I'm going to read a section of his poem, um, which I think some of you may already have read recently because I posted it on Facebook. Um, but uh, for those of you who haven't, it sort of names, name checks some of the, the, great, uh, the greats of the, the Bombay jazz and dance scene. It's called I dreamed I went to heaven by Ernest Flanagan. I dreamed I went to heaven. St. Peter stopped me at the door. He said, got plenty of musicians here. We don't need any more. He said, I'm tired of you fellas coming from Bombay, forming bands for one night stands, keeping eternity away. He said, the heavenly orchestra plays the classics all day. You guys want to play Masala and Bombay Mary here. Johnny Rodericks has formed a band up here and Jazzy Joe too. We have so many saxophone players, we don't know what to do. Chick Chocolate, George Fernandez, Chris Perry on trumpet too, composing mandos the whole day, just like he used to do. Benny Rosario and Oscar Rodericks are banging the piano keys. Ronnie Menezes and Richie Marcus are doing their best to please. Lloyd Fishery, Rex and Trini at the drums as quiet as can be. As soon as I turn my back, they will start a jugalbandi. Carlton Quito, Rudy Cotton, Mickey Correa and Ken Mack are all waiting for Pop to go and Bebop to come back. Mike Faye, Titus Mendes, all bass players jamming together. Claude De Costa and Cyril Atku's bass sound just like stormy weather. Ray Al and Benny Soans are jamming happily in one corner. Lester Rosario says, may I join? It will be my honor. Leslie Cudino and Cyril Sequeira try to assemble their old band. St. Peter said, all may not be in heaven, you'll have to understand. Rudy Servai and Morris Concesio set their own stage on fire. Along came old Nelly and said, my music will take you higher. Mike Gasper, Felix Torcato, uh, Hecky Kingdom, looking much alive, wore their angel wings, just waiting for their harps to arrive. Georgie Jacobs, um, who uh, arrived recently, was forming a new band. Herman Guitar, Irvi Drums said, we'll give you a hand. Mabel and Anibal said they would be very happy to fall in place with Michael Gracious, Georgie's old bass man playing double bass. Keith Kanga, Derek Julian, and Nandu Bende wanted Irvi too. They sent Victor Shreves in his place and George he had to make do. Pam Crane was also up there looking for a good piano man. Bonnie Remedius and Baby Men uh, Menezes said, any of us can. Peter Montserrat, uh, uh, Sebastian D'Souza and Johnny Gomes on sax said, Pam, take us to your band. Um, we know all your tracks. There were many more musicians, but I could not meet them all, all planning their hookups in that great big heavenly hall. St. Peter said, now look here, Ernie, we can't fit you in today. Go back down to earth first and learn how to play. And that's where Stanley takes off. Stanley, you knew many of these people yes. and you played with them. Very many of them. You, you started to talk about Ken Mack. Now that was a very interesting man. Ken Mack was an Anglo-Indian, except he lived like a Brit, like a European. He had a very nice apartment, which 
no other band leader in Bombay could afford. Uh, and he lived in this marvelous apartment near the Taj somewhere. Rose Garden. Garden. It was. What were you saying, Naresh? I think it was Rose Garden Road. Or some such thing. Um, he had a good band. It wasn't by any chance the best. I mean, Guri Sarai had a terrific band and so did Nelly and so did Johnny Baptist, the great Johnny Baptist, who I don't think was mentioned there. And Johnny Baptist did a Glenn Miller style uh, sound. He played the clarinet in front as Glenn Miller's band used to do. Anyway, but Ken Mack, McCarthy was his full name, took advantage of the fact that he was European and charged about twice as much as Goody or Johnny Baptist or anybody ever did. Now, remember, this is now the 50s. Goody charged 350 or 400 rupees for the whole band. Musicians got paid seven rupees and 10 rupees each. It was a lot of money, mind you, in those as these things go. So he charged 300, 350. Nelly charged more or less the same. Johnny Baptist, slightly less. Chris, uh, uh, my brother in law, late brother in law, Cyril Sequela, slightly less than that. Ken Mack charged 500 rupees. Now, very few people realized this. And one day, some friends of mine were going to have a wedding at some fancy place, I've forgotten now where, decided that they would really have a fancy wedding and have Ken Mack's band. So they asked me to take them to Ken Mack's home, which I did. I knew Ken Mack fleetingly. I knew his wife, Jean, and his uh, niece, Pam, who sang with him. So Pam and Jean sang with the band. And we went there. And we sat in this lovely living room. And then Ken strolled out wearing a smoking jacket, kept smoking a cigarette in a long ivory holder. My friends were quite, not intimidated, but impressed, certainly. And they said, we want to talk to you about a... She says, wait a minute, don't worry. Let's talk about business later. Have some tea. And a butler came out pushing a tray, a trolley, with tea on it. And all kinds of cakes and snacks on it. So he said to the butler, please, yes. And they, we poured out some tea. And the chap then said, uh, Mr. Mack, we want to talk to you. He said, please, have some tea. Have a, go and have a meeting. We'll talk about business. Business will be great. That's all right. You, you want me to come and put my band to play? I, me, I know I understand. In a very British accent, of course, which I can't imitate. And then when all that was done, he brought out a diary, a leather-bound diary, also very impressive, and said, so when is this wedding? And the chap told him, and he said, oh, yes, I'm free on that day. Where is it going to be? I just assumed that he was going to play. I said, where? Oh, very nice place. Very good. So what time? Seven o'clock as usual. Even? Very good. Good. Excellent. Why? Very good. Wonderful. Uh, and they said, all right. Now, no one's talking money. And at some point, Ken Mack says, oh, by the way, uh, as a matter of principle, I expect to be paid in advance. Because sometimes people cancel and so on, and, and then we get stuck. I have musicians to pay for for these things. So I, I expect you. And the gentleman who was there said, yes, of course, and whipped out his wallet. And he said, how much is that, Mr. Ken Mack? He said, oh, that's 500 rupees. The gentleman almost fainted because Goody charges 350. <laughs> Nelly charges 300. Ken Mack charged 500. Well, he paid up the 500 and we left, but that was Ken Mack, very clever businessman, smart man. So. That was the so Stanley, tell us of how you got into jazz and uh, how you got your start as a musician. Well, you know, uh, Naresh, there used to be something called the Ovaltine Amateur Hour. You remember that on Radio Salon? Also before your time. Ovaltine Amateur Hour, Hamid Sayani used to run it. Uh, and uh, I must have been, I, I don't know, eight years old, 10 years old, something like that. And my mother, who was always very ambitious for me, uh, took me to the Overteen Amateur Hour. And I, they used to have a rehearsal or audition. And Dorothy Jones, a fair 
Anglo Indian, almost British. He used to wear a turban, I remember, and he used to use Chanel number no. five perfume. So Dorothy Jones, who was the band leader of a trio, or maybe it was a quartet, at the Berry's restaurant, she used to be the piano accompanist at the Ovaltine Amateur. And to make a long story short, I began to play and to sing at the Ovaltine Amateur. Every three or four months, Hamid would call and I'd go there and sing. I got to know uh, Dorothy as a result. Then I used to sing at the All India Radio at a children's hour. They used to have wonderful things in those days. Children's hour. And I used to sing there as well. And Dorothy Jones was the accompanist there as well. And later, Tony, uh, Tony Newton is the case. Later. Anyway, Dorothy Jones once met me on the street and said, how are you, my dear chap? How good to see you. You should come to Berry sometime. You know, I play there. And so one Sunday morning after church at Dabul, I got into the train and went to Churchgate and went to Berry's. And I was hooked, wasn't I? Because there was this quartet. There was Robin Jones, her son, is it, was the drummer. They all went off to England and Robin later had his own band in England. You probably know that, Naresh. So Robin was a drummer. There was a marvelous guitarist. What was his name? With a with great big dark glasses he used to wear. Uh, anyway, I was completely hooked. I went every Sunday morning to Berry's for their so-called jam session. And for me, that was much more important than studies. I went to St. Xavier's College, didn't do terribly well, failed the inter-arts examination twice to my father's absolute horror because he was a silver, medal, uh, silver medalist of St. Xavier's College, a school. And then I quit without telling him. And I went off to become a musician. I remember Father Eddie de Cruz was the principal, and he asked me, uh, why are you leaving college? And I said, because it's interfering with my education. That's the kind of cheeky son of a gun I was. I went off to become a musician, and my first job was in Delhi, at the Imperial in Delhi, with Godfrey Saldana's band. And after that, after a year of that, that's where I became very friendly with Tiki Oberoi, and that's another story. And I came back to Bombay, and I began to work at the Nutraj with the Morris, Morris Changers band. Morris Changer arrived with vibraphones that nobody had ever seen in India. Later, Margaret Mason uh, came in from England at the La Bella restaurant with Michael. Morris Changer used to work on the B, BI ships, the British India ships. So the musicians would go from Bombay, they'd fly to Nairobi or somewhere and jump on the ship there and go to England and other place and come back and then fly back from Nairobi to Bombay. When Morris Concesio went, no, Morris Changer, one time when he went, he took with him all those bulbul tarang stuff, you know? You know those little things that you put you, with typewriter keys and you played, he took that and he checked it in at the customs and had it entered into his passport as a vibraphone. Customs people don't know what the hell they're talking about, vibraphone. And he came back with a vibraphone without paying any custom duty on it. He said, I've had it for years. I bought it years ago. I took it from here when I went. And that was the end of that. So we had that band. Anibal Castro was there with the band. Uh, and I played there for a while. And then I went to Calcutta because in Calcutta, Furpose, Cecil Dorsey was going away for uh, three months to England. And they used to have all these wonderful cabaret artists who would arrive with their own music. And the piano, pianists had to know how to read music, which I did. And they couldn't find somebody else. And they took, I, I was taken off there to Calcutta. And that was the beginning of two years in Calcutta where I began to lead my own band there. And, and, and so that's my story. And I came back and I went, came, joined Berry's of all places. Old man Berry was a lovely man. So I had a trio there with Irvin Gabriel on bass, wonderful bass player, and Chapel Leo and then Florian on drums. And a girl called Margarita, 
who sang. She was Ken Cummins' lady friend, Margaret. That's when I got completely disenchanted. I had joined, gone into music to be a jazz musician. I was now playing Kiss Me, Honey, Honey, Kiss Me and House of Bamboo. I had had enough of that. The only thing I knew how to do besides that was to write. Could be a writer. And someone said to me, you can't be a journalist. You couldn't afford the cigarettes you smoke. I should smoke l &M cigarettes. On payday, I'd go and buy two cartons of cigarettes for the month. And another young man was sitting with us at lunch, along with Jatin Das, the famous artist, and Navin Nishal, who became a film star and unfortunately died very early. He said, why don't you try advertising? They pay quite well. So I went off into, I asked him, who pays the best in advertising? Fortunately, he knew something, this guy. The biggest ad agency was Thompson's. And then there was McCann. And then there was Benson's, o, uh, OBM, it was called in those days. Ogilvy, Benson, and Meta. Lintas existed only to produce advertising for levers. Lintas was Lever's international advertising service. We were there for Lever's. So we were a small agency, but a wonderful agency. He said Lintas pays the best. Thank God that's what he told me. And I went to the cashier, asked the telephone directory, found the address to Lintas. Next morning, I told my hand wrote a letter to apply for a job at Lintas. And that's how it all started. That's how I got into advertising. So uh, what was it about jazz that attracted you? Why did you want to play this music rather than House of Bamboo? Yeah. You know, Naresh, as you know, well, I'm sure most, most people would. There are really only two musics in the world where you play a theme and then you improvise on that theme. In Western music, jazz, in those days, every song is based on chords. Now you'd play the song and then you'd improvise on those chords. And you could improvise 10 choruses. And each one was a different, you, in other words, it was creative. The only other music, by the way, in the world that does that is Indian music. As I'm sure you'd guess by now. You play a rag and then you take off. Ravi Shankar performed at the, at a, uh, that famous thing that happened in America, and he performed the uh, concert for Bangladesh. He played one raga and he, inter he, he uh, created things on it, themes on it, for 40 minutes, one raga. So for me, jazz was not House of Bamboo. It was the whole idea of creating things. Uh, somewhere in me, there was this whole streak for creativity, and that was jazz. The hell was never on Sunday and House of Bamboo. You wrote a wonderful piece a few years ago in Upper Crust. Yes. That, sort of that one stretch of Churchgate Street. Tell us about the establishments that were on that street and who played there, the people you ran into in those years. First of all, you need to know, Naresh, that every restaurant of, the, of a certain kind had a band playing there. And it was not a band playing Hindi music or Hindi film. Hindi film music didn't feature. I mean, there was Hindi music up there somewhere. It certainly didn't happen in the restaurants. Now, let's talk about these restaurants just on Churchgate Street. You start at the corner of Marine Drive. There was an Iran Air shop, the uh, uh, outlet at there. But the first place there was Napoli. Now, Napoli didn't have a live band, but they had the only jukebox in Bombay and possibly in India. So people would go there to play jukebox music. Opposite Napoli was Jazz by the Bay. They had a band. Then you walk down from Napoli and two or three buildings down was the Ambassador Hotel. Now the Ambassador Hotel was owned by this remarkable Greek man called Jack Voyances. You have, and they had a nightclub, I forgot that, what was it called? The other room? 
No, it was the other room. I've forgotten what it's called. The other room. Hmm. I think it was the other room. Maybe it was the other room. And Tony Pinto's quartet played there. Before that, it was Dizzy Sal, I think, played there. And when Dizzy Sal got ailed and returned to Bangalore, Tony Pinto uh, played there with Norman Mopsby on the tennis saxophone and a man called Vivian singing, wonderful singer. Tony Pinto is a terrific uh, piano player. He's in Canada now. He's almost 90 and he recently performed and got the first prize for something or the other, an all Canada contest. Marvelous man. So you couldn't go into the other room except in a jacket and tie. And unlike other places, they didn't give you a jacket and a tie if you came without one. They just threw you out. So there was the ambassador. And that was only dinner, no lunchtime, no nothing. Tony Pinto was in college at St. was in those days and I was there at the same time. Then he moved down from there and you came to Bombelli's, which was owned by a Swiss gentleman called Freddie Bombelli. Freddie Bombelli owned Bombelli's. They had a band. And there was a low sort of partition wall that separated Bombelli from Berries. And Berries always had a band as well. And since they were small restaurants, they had trios or a guitar-led quartet. Opposite Bombelli's and Berries was Gaylord's. I'm sure it's still there. I hope it's still there. It is. Isn't it? But Gaylord's had a band. And the band leader was a man called Ken Cummins. Ken come and played the violin. I remember he only wore white cashmere suits. His bands would be in a dark suit and he wore white. He had a daughter. I forget her name now. She later married Wensi Fernandez, who was Braz Gonzalez's drummer at the Venice. And they went off to Australia and Wensi died for some reason not so long ago. But so there was Gaylords. Next to Gaylords, was a restaurant that didn't have a band, but I went there at least twice a month to eat their steaks. It was Gurdon, Swiss Gurdon himself, old man with the wal walrus moustache. You always saw him at the hockey stadium every day when the hockey was on. You went down, you turned around right, and you came to the Astoria Hotel, which had the Venice restaurant. That became the fount of all jazz. I'm not sure how it happened. The man who owned, Mehtani was his name, owned Astoria, couldn't, wouldn't know jazz from a hole in his bum. But they had jazz. And I don't know how that happened. And somewhere along the line, Braz arrived there. And Braz led the finest jazz band this country has ever known. I really mean, I mean that even today. There never was, and never has been, and never is even today, a jazz musician like Braz. I remember that when Duke Ellington came, they were in the city for five days, five nights. Every night, musicians from Ellington's band would arrive and jam out at the Venice with Braz and his group. Um, and one night, on the fourth night, Ellington himself came. He was traveling at that time with a Spanish Contessa. And I can, I, I can see he was a tall, very statesman-like man. He was wearing a blue silk shirt and the lady came and they came in and he was very amused to see Cat Anderson and, and, the, and Jimmy Hamilton just was all playing with the band. And as something you don't know, uh, Naresh, you probably don't know, one of the things that Ellington was supposed to do was the State Department sent them out, as you, as you said earlier. He was supposed to locate fine musicians and bring them into America. In South Africa, he discovered Dollar Brand and took Dollar Brand to, who be, then became Abdullah Ibrahim. In India, he offered Braz a job in his band and to come with him to America. And I don't know how well you know Braz, but Braz is a very shy man. He doesn't speak English terribly well. I'm not sure how well educated he is. He's certainly educated in music. 
Did you know what Brazil's first job was? What was a, a circus. A circus, that's right. Now, Braz got so nervous about even thinking of going to America. And we were all saying to him, brother, you're completely mad. Duke Ellington is taking you to America. You're not just going to America, you're going to start at the top. And Braz didn't go. He was just too nervous. If he was married then, which he wasn't, I think Yvonne might have gone with him and taken him along. But he wasn't married at that time, I don't think. And so he didn't go. So that was uh, the an, uh, next to them, next to the Astoria was the Airlines Hotel, I think it was called. And they had a restaurant which sometimes had a band, sometimes didn't. Then across the road from there, have you kept count of all these restaurants? And they were all in just 200 yards. Was the Ritz Hotel, the Little Hut. Neville Thomas was the piano player there. And Noel Thomas and so on. You know, that was a lovely quartet. Neville and Noel played, Noel played the alto saxophone. Then you had to walk down past the Oval Maidan and get to Flora Fountain. Whatever Chauk it's called, I can never pronounce it. Everything in Bombay is either Chhatrapati something, which I just about managed. Everything is Chhatrapati, including the museum. Thank you, Viroza. Chhatrapati, indeed. So there was, at that end, there was the bistro. Johnny Fernandez played there. Chick's daughter Ursula sang there. That's where she met Johnny. Sabi Dias was a band leader, I remember. And then next door to him was the Volga, the Heki Kingdom. For my money, the finest trio that played at that time. Richie Marquis, Maxi, and Percy Dias, who played bass like the Americans played bass. He didn't just play, you know, he, he was wonderful. Heki was old fashioned. He played the baritone sax and he played the alto sax. So that, and then finally at the far end near Kalagoda came La Bella. And it opened with Margaret Mason's English band with this. And I remember that I used to steal a rupee from my father's pocket to go there, to bunk college and go there. A glass, a cup of espresso was 80 paisa. That was it. We're talking about 1959, 60, my dear chap. Uh, I'm 78 years old now, by the way. I may not sound it, but I am. So 80 paisa or the equivalent of in annas, four annas or something. And one, you give a 20 paisa tip and that was it, one rupee for a cup of espresso, which we had never tasted anywhere before. We had never, we didn't know what the hell, not espresso. Uh, what's the other thing? Cappuccino. The cappuccino. We had never heard of cappuccino. Anyway, so that was the jazz scene in Bombay. There was also the Shalima Hotel, uh, at, uh, I think near Kemp's Corner, Shalima Hotel. They had a band. Bonnie Remedius played there for years and years and years. Bonnie Remedius did his fast domino thing on Sundays at the Venice, where Braz was. And then there used to be this ensign from the Navy, a Sardarji called Iqbal Singh. And Iqbal Singh used to do the Elvis Presley thing at the, at the Venice. So that, as it were, was the scene, the jazz scene, the nightclub scene. Who, who were the characters and what were the famous rivalries you remember uh, of that time? There weren't any great rivalries because, you know, you got a job. It was always a six month contract from April to September and a new contract from October to uh, March. These were the contract time. And everyone, somehow everyone got a job. On Kalba Devi, the road near Princess Street, every morning you'd go there and you'd find every single Goan musician there. By 10, 30, 11, they'd arrive. And anybody had a contract to play for a wedding or something, had to, had to pick up musicians, you'd go there and pick up the musicians. And what are you doing on so-and-so day? Are you busy on this? Day? And pick these chaps up and form bands. So there was no great rivalry. Uh, I had a interesting experience with a man called Kirkar. What Kirkar was he? The Taj. 
अशोक अजीत के अजीत अजीत वॉज दफ एट बी हेड ऑफ दाज दे वॉज स्टार्टिंग नाइट क्लॉक विच प्लेट ऑन द डे दे नीडेड अ बैंड I was at that time with my trio at the Berries. Somebody told him about us, and next thing I know, I interviewed for the job for a five-piece uh, uh, band, signed the contract, good money, and there I was. I was going to be playing at this wonderful new restaurant at the Taj. The Taj always was and probably still is the place for these things, for quality and class. Two weeks. before we could start i get a call from kelkar's office not even from kelkar from kelkar's office informing me that the, the restaurant opening has been delayed by 6 months or 8 months or something and therefore we were not required to start playing and so on today okay so i went to the taj in the morning to meet mr kelkar and said so when will this thing start is you know i don't know i, I, I said all right I, then i asked the obvious question i assume we still have a contract and he said what contract there's no restaurant so i said but we have a contract which you've signed so see yes i know when the contract is now not in void we will see when the restaurant starts we'll think about it again and i said to mr kelkar i've got four musicians who are married have families have children they will not get another job for 6 months because that's the way it is and he said well i'm not here to support your musicians so sir mr kirkar you signed a contract and he said the equivalent of so sue me and that was the end of that i left i went home i went back to the to, i was a little class in those days i hand wrote a letter to mr j r d tata and i said we hear so much about the name of tata i don't believe it here's the experience i've had here is this contract that was signed and your man has refused to honor it it's not worth the paper is written on you can keep it mr jarvi and with it you can keep your reputation of being bloody 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 four or five days later i get a phone call narish from a very imperious sounding woman a passy lady saying mr tata would like to see you and so i went up there and it wasn't jrd it was his brother drd and drd tata little sparrow of a man sitting behind this large uh, table and i went there he says how dare you insult us and say that at which point to my great disgrace i started to cry i said you've called me here to shout at me for something that i should be shouting at you for your man signed a contract with me my musicians are out in the street without job and without money and you think i have done the wrong thing by writing to you and he said the tatas never renege on a contract and he put his hand in a drawer and picked out a check in my name for the full 6 months and said there you are i don't expect you'll be working at the taj after this but please tell your musicians they don't have to stop and he gave me this and lovely many 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 years later when i was working in malaysia and i used to go twice a year to london or new york where my offices were in london new york i got into the aircraft in malaysia and of course i traveled first i was chairman of the company and it stopped at bombay airport and picked up passengers from bombay airport and mr ajit kerkar came on board and ajit kerkar ended up sitting next to me so he sat there took his jacket off i looked at him and i looked away saying oh god am i going to have nine hours with this man and then he stuck his hand out to me and said my name is kerkar i didn't take his hand i said i know and he looked at me and said have we met i said yes we met and i'll never forget you and he said please tell me who what and he said do you remember that musician who you signed a contract with and then reneged on the contract and drd tata paid that musician the full six month check 
because you reneged on it. He, I, I could see that he knew exactly what I was talking about. I said, that was me. So he, he was probably wondering what's this flipping musician doing in a first class seat in an international flight. And then he said, I suppose I better find somewhere else to sit. I said, I think that would be a good idea. And he moved to another seat somewhere. It wasn't for moved to another seat. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ajit Kira. Later on, I heard he got sacked anyway for all kinds of, you know. So, uh, you, but when you went to Calcutta, you continued um, uh, to uh, be part of the, 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 the organizing scene. And uh, you would bring some musicians from the Yatra to Calcutta. That's right. Well, Jazz Yatra then, started. Jazz Yatra started here. I was at that time working in Calcutta with Lintas. I started to have, I decided to have a jazz international festival there as well. And you know, you don't, you may not know this, Naresh, or you may not have known it. The biggest jazz club in the world at that time was the Polish jazz club. The biggest jazz club in the world was in Poland. And Russia had jazz, and Hungary had jazz, and they played jazz, they played their own folk music and rendered that into jazz. It was wonderful. The communists were running Bengal at that time. Jyoti Basu was, and Jyoti Basu was a Renaissance man, a very fine man, very well spoken, very well read, and all that. Uh, you know, you're a communist either because you can't afford anything else or because you're such an intellectual. And he was an intellectual. I'd met him. So I went to Jyoti Basu and said, we want to have a jazz festival here. There are musicians coming to Bombay and I can get them to come here. But there are musicians in Poland and Hungary. So I want to get them. And he said, fine. And he got his man, Minister of Culture or whatever, to introduce me to the ambassadors or consul generals of these uh, places. And next thing I know, we had musicians coming from there. The first time I remember, Naresh, the Poles arrived in a Boeing 747 type plane. They brought three bands with them. One was a quartet, one was a quintet, and one was a big band. And they bought two tons of sound system because we had no sound. In India, we never had a damn thing, I say. We had no sound. They brought the sound system that we used for eight days for our jazz festival, which was held in the lords of St. Paul's Cathedral in Calcutta. And Niranjan Javeri used to run the jazz yatra in Bombay with your husband, Firoz, uh, Firoza, I think. Jamshed, no? I think Jamshed is Firoza's S. uncle. S.P. Godridge was his good friend, my uncle. Ah, OK. S.P. So, but, yeah. but I used to attend those at Rang Bhavan every That's night. Right. That's right. Well. Uh, Niranjan Javeri was running it. He, he was the idea, idealist, ideas, the ideas man for this. And I got this deal going with Niranjan. I would send him the bands that came from Poland and Hungary and so on. And he'd send me these uh, Bombay while I was there. So people like Joe Williams and you know, all, of the, all of them came to Calcutta as well. So yes, I got into the organization of bands. Yeah, um, in that big plane, the Polish, the Poles also brought a film crew. Uh, and they made absolutely it, right. You're absolutely right. They absolutely made a film that it's it's only listed on the internet, and I've always wanted to be able to see that footage and never had a chance to. Well, a very interesting thing happened, uh, Naresh. Uh, we had a small group of five couples who were very close friends. We were families. We were family more than anything else. One of them happened to be the Swedish consul general, but he was also the head of SAS and Thai who are my clients as well. Mm -hmm. My class because he was my friend. So I used to do the advertising person some time. I was, uh, Sven Palm got transferred to Budapest. So Yvonne and I went to Budapest for the holiday and we were staying in Sven's home. And suddenly the TV was on and we were eating uh, dinner and a voice came on and Sven and I looked at each other it was me making the announcements at the Calcutta Jazz Festival where the Hungarians had performed. 
and that film that the Poles made had been given to all the uh, Eastern European countries and they were playing them on all the TV uh, stations. So that's another story. Ah, I wish uh, I, I wish a, a copy of that was still available, but uh, let's, take, let's take questions now.